GW has come out with some rules changes for the Eldar today. Phoenix Lords and Solitaires work a bit more as intenders, a bunch of bugs fixed throughout the Codex, and support weapon crew no longer punch like demons. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where today we've got a small update for 40k for the Eldar, it's their Codex's FAQ and Errata, fixing a whole bunch of bugs and unintended errors within the Codex, though I'm afraid at this stage there aren't any balance changes that will be coming out in the balance data slate, which they've said is coming sometime this week, hopefully either today or tomorrow, I'll certainly be covering it on the channel as soon as it's out. In the meantime though, we've got a rather hefty stack of FAQs for the Eldari Codex, quite a lot of bug fixes and things to make their army rules work, and a few unintentional things toned down. Let's take a look through then, and have a look at what we've got. First up, there's a change to Warp Spider's Flicker Jump, the ability that they get to move 6 inches when they're charged, meaning they're usually going to be very hard to charge indeed. Like a lot of similar abilities, you're now able to redeclare charges against different targets after the squad has moved, so just by accidentally declaring some warp spiders, you don't necessarily stop your unit from being able to charge anything whatsoever when they run away. They're still going to remain very hard to get to grips with though, but if there's anything else within charge range, at least you can charge that instead. Perhaps one of the most obvious errors in the book were the support weapon stats. For some reason on their stat line, the basic support weapons had 7 attacks, kind of impressive just for 2 guardian crewmen, and a bit weird that they actually weren't too bad at punching very light infantry to death. Their mighty 7 attacks have been rained down to just 2, and their leadership has been dropped down to 7 from 10. I can only assume there was a bit of a copy-paste error going on there somewhere, maybe they'd accidentally borrowed the stats from the avatar of Cain. Next up, in another very expected one, the Harlequin's troop gains the core keyword, a bit of a blatant omission when the datasheet came out, particularly given the Skyweaver bikes had it. It would be very strange for the only troop's choice of the faction not to gain core when a lot of their abilities key off it, and I suspect that the vast majority of people were playing the troops as having core, as it was clearly what was intended. I guess it remains to be seen just how hard Games Workshop chooses to swing the balance hammer against them, though. I have a feeling that Harlequin troops aren't going to be quite as strong as they were when the Codex dropped after this balanced data slate. Next up, for the Solitaire's Blitz ability, it said that you could do it instead of a normal move. They do imply that the Blitz ability itself does constitute a normal move now. I guess it was kind of implied already, but maybe it's not too bad to explicitly state it. For Battle Focus, they've added an FAQ as a designer's note. One question I've seen come up really quite a lot was whether or not the LA Top Fieldcraft trait allowed you to ignore the negative move penalties that you got when you moved through area terrain with Battle Focus. The answer to that was no as the Alatoc rule is purely to do with your move characteristic, and Battle Focus doesn't really have anything to do with the move characteristic of the actual model, it's kind of its own thing. They've reaffirmed that and said that Alatoc definitely does not affect that move, which I think is useful enough, as it was one that was quite commonly being asked. They also clarify that in a similar vein, matchless agility also doesn't ignore the penalty. That's the stratagem that allows you to automatically Battle Focus 6 inches. They confirm that you still do take the negative penalty for area terrain with that as well, so it'd usually be 3 inches there. I don't think either of those are technically changes at all, but it's good to have them clear. In a similar vein, there's another FAQ for Strands of Fate as well. Basically, if you make 1 dice into a 6 out of a multi-dice roll, say for example put a 6 into a charge roll, if you're going to command re-roll that roll, then it means that you do have to re-roll the dice that you substituted in as well. Again, I don't think that's a change at all, but it does just mean that it's a bit painful to lose your substituted roll, meaning that you're often going to have a very low chance of succeeding that charge. Next up, in another small bug fix, Inari are confirmed to get Strands of Fate on their craft world units, even if they take mixed attachments with Harlequins and Drakari in them. I think just technically due to the keywords, they might not get Strands of Fate due to including mixed units technically, though it did seem like it was the intention that Inari do get Strands of Fate, as their units have it. The Twilight Harlequins, the ones that are extra good at combat, have a tweak to their stratagem, Malicious Frenzy technically didn't have a end clause, I believe, so once you used it, technically your units could, in theory, auto-wound on sixes to hit for the rest of the game, though to be honest, I don't think many reasonable people would have played it that way. As a small clarification to Anwraith spells, they now only do buff Anwraith core or character units. Maybe there's a bit of a keyword technicality that I'm missing there, but I think that's how I would have played it anyway. Strand of Fate and Luck of the Laughing God both had units that I think could technically break it, Phoenix Lord no longer breaks Strands of Fate, and the Solitaire no longer breaks the Luck of the Laughing God rule. Again, I don't think many people would have played it that they did. I think it was just due to them not really wording the rule very carefully. There's a small tweak to Banshee Masks. 
They still keep their fight last thing, but they basically had a slightly weird ability where they could prevent Overwatch or set to defend for a target the entire phase, even if the Howling Banshee units completely failed their charge. I guess in theory you could use a Howling Banshee unit 12 inches away just to declare a charge, get rid of Overwatch from one unit, and then charge them with a fragile unit much closer, and that unit still wouldn't be able to Overwatch, even though there weren't any Howling Banshees anywhere near it. They now only deny Overwatch and set to defend against their own charge, not against other Eldar units. I guess that is a bit of a common sense change, though I don't think it's going to be all that meaningful in quite a lot of situations. I wouldn't really be expecting Howling Banshees to be failing that many charges with how much crazy movement they have. There's a small tweak to the Phoenix Lord Baharoth and his pretty crazy Cloud Strider ability. That's the one that allows him to jump all over the board each turn, redeploying whenever he makes a battle focus move or a consolidate move. I felt the need to clarify that you can only use Cloud Strider once per turn. So while his mobility is still pretty crazy, he can't say shoot and then redeploy, and then charge something and then redeploy again. I think he could technically shoot, then charge in the same turn, as I believe that his Cloud Strider ability replaced the Battle Focus move as opposed to countered as a special type of it. I'm not 100% clear on that though, and either way it doesn't really matter, as basically there's no way that he's doing it twice in the same turn anymore. Finally for the changes, the Scorpion X arc now has a war gear change. Previously you could replace his chainsword with a scorpion claw, they've now changed it so you replace the pistol with a scorpion claw, as that's how the actual X arc model is modelled. Kind of makes sense, and that's really quite a lot superior to be honest. It means it's a bit more fighting in combat with that extra attack, as opposed to having a pistol he's not really going to use due to having the better claw attack. Finally there's things that's unchanged in the codex. I must admit, I was kind of half expecting them to alter Eldritch Storm to happen the next turn. That's the one where they deal a whole bunch of mortal wounds out at enemy units within a certain radius. I don't think it really needed changing, to be honest. At least it's now an option that you might occasionally use. But they do have rather a lot of these abilities that you declare on one turn, then they happen on the next. So it's quite a powerful one to actually be able to strike on the same turn, even if you have to sacrifice a fair bit of casting for it. In any case, they seem happy with the way it is. Definitely a reasonable incentive not to clump up too much if you're going to be playing against Eldar. The other thing that I suspect will get errated at some point down the line are the Forge World Eldar units. With the last updates, they've often updated the Imperial Armor Compendium at the same time as the Codex FAQ, but it seems that we're still waiting for any changes to Eldar Forge World units. Currently, they've not done anything with them. They need a bunch of keywords adding to make them work with some of the new rules and some people were wondering whether or not they might grant the Shadow Spectres the updated Aspect Armor rule to add in that 5 plus invul save. I'm sure there'll be other things throughout the Codex that I thought were a bit odd when I actually looked at them at the time, though nothing else springs to mind at the moment. If there's anything else that you were expecting to get an FAQ that didn't, please let us know down in the comments. So overall, perhaps not the most massive changes to the Eldar. I'd say perhaps the most important things are the Harlequin troops gaining core, the support weapons getting less attacks, and I think that even if they don't really change rules as written, the FAQ clarifications to the Battle Focus and Strands of Fate both are pretty useful. Hopefully we'll have the actual balanced data slate changes coming out sometime in the near future, I'll most certainly be covering them on the channel, so feel free to subscribe to Allspex Tactics if you'd like to see them covered in a similar way. Finally, if you've been enjoying the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that Allspex Tactics does have a Patreon page, which you can find down in the video description below. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things happen next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with the chance to win some really big model kits every month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, then the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.